Hi guys, I am going to um, read the first part of chapter one of Lincoln by Harold Holzer with permission from the author. Um, this is called The Making of a Liberator. And I think in my last video, I was asking you to figure out what a liberator is. And a liberator, as you can tell by the OR ending, is someone who liberates or makes people free. I have always thought that all men should be free. Abraham Lincoln proudly remembered near the end of his eventful life. Then he joked, whenever I hear anyone arguing for slavery, I feel a strong impulse to see it tried on him personally. By then, the 13th Amendment was well on its way to being ratified by the states. Ratified means being approved. And Lincoln was already known as the great emancipator. But even earlier, Lincoln had declared, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. Lincoln himself had been born in 1809 in the state of Kentucky, a place where slavery was perfectly legal and widely accepted. His father was a poor farmer. Thomas Lincoln had never enough money to afford slaves of his own to work on his land, but even if he had been wealthier, he might have never agreed to do so. Thomas was a religious man and did not believe God gave any human being the right to own another. He thought slavery was also unfair to poor white people who were forced to till their own soil without the help of slave labor, slave labor. It was said that there were no more than 50 slaves in the entire Kentucky County where the Lincolns lived, but Thomas objected anyway. In 1816, when Abe was seven, Thomas moved his family northwest to the state of Indiana, mostly in search of better land and more opportunity, but perhaps to get farther away from slavery as well. Young Abe grew up in Indiana without seeing much of much of schoolrooms. I could hardly read or write, he remembered. My education had been sadly neglected. He did not see much of slavery either. Coming of age in Indiana, Lincoln seldom glimpsed any black people at all, slave or free. Meanwhile, his father continued to struggle to make ends meet. Often when the family needed extra money, Thomas hired Abe out to his neighbors for a fee and, as the law dictated, collected all of Abe's salary for himself. Abe did not to get did not get to keep a penny of the money he earned with his own sweat. He was something like a slave himself. And he was very much in demand. By the time he was a teenager, Abe had already was already more than six feet tall and so strong he could chop down trees, split log rails, and build wooden fences faster than most grown men. Most of the farmers who hired Abe liked him very much. He told funny stories and excelled at sports like wrestling. But the farmers also noticed that they weren't watching him closely. Abe often put his axe down and headed for the nearest tree to sit in the shade and read. His nose always seemed to be buried in a book. When Abe's mother, Nancy, died in 1818, Thomas found a new wife and brought her back to the family cabin to help raise Abe and his sister. So that would make this woman Abe's stepmother. Nancy, Sarah, Bush, Johnston, Lincoln, brought along four of her own children some furniture that seemed far better than any Abe had ever seen, and most important of all, books. Reading them by firelight or whenever his father allowed him time from his chores to study, his back propped up against an upside-down chair. Abe devoured every book he could get his hands on. As he grew older, he read newspapers, too. His stepmother, Sarah, who encouraged him, turned out to be one of the most important people in the future president's entire life. She, had she not insisted that Thomas give the boy as much time as possible to read, he might have ended up a poor farmer like his father, who could, Abe remembered, only bunglingly sign his own name. Around the age of 15, Abe scribbled his first lines of poetry in a large book. Whether he copied them for another book or invented them himself is not known. However, his neighbors noted that he enjoyed making up rhymes, usually to tease the local preacher. Certainly the verses reveal their author already to be a talented, humorous young man with his eye on the future. Abraham Lincoln, his hand and pen. He will be good, but God knows when. Abraham Lincoln is my name, and with my pen I wrote the same. I wrote it in both haste and speed and left it here for fools to read. Young Abe read the entire Bible, including the Old Testament story of the Jewish people's escape from slavery in Egypt. It made a strong impression on him. He also enjoyed poetry, Aesop's fables, and an, and an especially popular book of the day about the life of George Washington. The Washington book he borrowed from one of his neighbors and loved it so much, he took it to bed with him in the small loft where he slept in the family cabin, right beneath the roof line. One night it rained so hard that water leaked into the ceiling and soaked the old book. Its pages swelled with water. Lincoln apologized to its owner, who made him 
work in the fields until the ruined volume was paid for. Lincoln hated the chores he had to do, but he never forgot the incident or the book. He loved its chapters about the battlefields, heroes, and hardships of the rev revolution. But these stories also set him to thinking, boy, even though I was, that there was something special that these soldiers fought for, something that held out a great promise to all the people of all the world for all time to come. And that was the promise in the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal and shared the same right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The idea would never leave him. When he was 22, Abe and his family packed up and moved yet again, this time to the state of Illinois. There, he helped his father clear new land for planting and chopped wood to build a new log cabin home. He was an adult now, and it was time to strike out on his own. After a terrible winter, he finally said his goodbyes and headed off to begin life away from his family. He settled in a small Illinois village alongside a shallow river, the town of New Salem. Few black people lived in the vicinity of this of his new hometown. Out of 12,000 settlers in the county, only 38 were black and two thirds of those were free people of color. But Lincoln came face to face with slavery soon enough. Abe had earlier joined a group of friends on an adventure to the deep south. Their plan was to float some cargo on a wooden flatboat down the Mississippi River all the way to New Orleans. Along the way, their craft came under attack one night by a group of seven black men who meant to rob them. Lincoln and his companions fought them off, but not before a knife or some other weapon sliced into Abe's thumb. Lincoln bore a scar from the battle for the rest of his life, but never blamed all people of color for the experience, nor did it stop him and his friends from taking a second flatboat of goods down the Mississippi soon after. The sight of New Orleans, the Crescent City, as it was known, must have dazzled him. Lincoln had never seen such a big place. New Orleans was filled with handsome wooden homes, restaurants, hotels, churches, and exotic people who spoke French as well as English. But something else was different here. The streets were crowded with black people and not all of them walked the streets freely. Many were slaves. Some were actually marched together along in chains. And worst of all, some were sold in the streets at slave markets or auctions, sometimes offered to the highest bidder like cattle. Some of these people had just been separated from mates, children, brothers, and sisters without giving their consent, but their sorrow did not matter either to their masters or the slave traders, for enslaved black people had no rights at all. The male slaves who looked strongest and the women who looked as if they could bear the most children went for the highest prices. The white women who gathered to bid on them poked at the slaves or opened their mouths to check their teeth. They treated these human beings like animals. If the slaves objected, they were ignored or whipped. Lincoln visited the slave market one day during his New Orleans visit and looked in horror as a young girl was dragged to the platform to be auctioned off. Abe's cousin remembered, quote, there it was we saw Negroes chained, maltreated, whipped, and scourged. I can say knowingly it was on this trip that he formed his opinion on slavery. It ran its iron in him then and there, end quote. Supposedly, Abe turned to his friends in a fury and said, by God, boys, let's get away from this. If I ever get a chance to hit that thing, by which he meant slavery. I'll hit it hard. It was later proven that this witness was not even traveling with Lincoln on that voyage to Louisiana, but there is no doubt that Lincoln did observe slaves being sold on the New Orleans streets and did find the sight sickening. Others agreed that he was so upset he could barely speak. He later sadly recounted the experience to his friends back home in Illinois. The horrific sight of human beings shackled together and sold as property may have changed Lincoln's life and eventually the nation's life forever. I'm going to stop there for today.